salam to the shaykh and he said, Shaykh, and then the shaykh, he didn't go in straight out of respect, obviously, he's entering someone else's house. He basically um, stayed outside, so I was literally just behind him. And then um, as he stayed outside, he's gone into the house. We've gone into the house now. As we've gone into the house, he's we waited in a room and then they brought Shaykh al Muhsin al Bad inside on a wheelchair. <coughs> And then the Shaykh, subhanAllah, you can see the happiness in his heart. Even Shaykh al bad the smile that they both put on their hearts as soon as they gave each other salam. The Shaykh kissed him on his head, gave him salam. Shaykh Muhammad kissed him on his head, gave him salam. And then, subhanAllah, they kissed each other, hugged each other. You know, they gave each other that mutual respect and hug. You know, and then the straight away, Shaykh al bad as he sits, his hey bow, he is, start asking questions. And Shaykh Muhammad al said that, we heard you're sick, you're not well, what happened? He goes, Alhamdulillah, I'm okay, I'm better now. Whatever, I went, had, had checkups and whatnot, I'm better, Alhamdulillah, you know how it is. And then... Harakatuhum wa humumuhum wa uzumuhum Lillahi la lil khalqi wa shaytani نعم الرفيق لطالب السبل التي تفضي إلى الخيرات والإحسان تفضي إلى الخيرات والإحسان بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين فاللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا ولمشايخنا ولجميع المسلمين أجمعين أعكس الله عز وجل to accept this gathering and this video to make it sincere for his sake and to make it from those that benefit those listening This video is a video on a specific scholar, individual, and to be honest, I delayed this video purposely because I didn't even know where to begin. That's how sad the news was for me when it reached me of our beloved Sheikh, our teacher, our father, our mentor, Sheikh and Sheikh Abdul Rahman Ibn Salih Muhyiddin. May Allah have mercy on him and elevate his rank and grant his family patience and make him from those that enter Genesis for those in A'la bi ghayri hisab wa la adab and all our ulama and the Muslims may Allah Azza wa forgive the Muslims those that are alive and those that are deceased may Allah Azza wa Jal guide us all Muslims make us unite upon a tawheed and upon sincerity and make us from those that follow the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best role model and the best man to walk upon this earth. Now, alhamdulillah, one of the brothers um, sent me a profile, or I should say a biography, short biography of the Sheikh. So I would read that out for those that don't know, or those that didn't know him. And it's really nice, but so people can benefit, inshallah. Those listening, and inshallah, then I would... Um, Add to that which I know from the Shaykh. And of course, before even doing that, we know the hadith. كَمَا قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله لا ينتزع العلم انتزاع من صدر الرجال ولا يقبض هذا العلم يعني بقبض الرجال من صدورهم وإنما يقبض هذا العلم بقبض العلماء يقبض هذا العلم بقبض العلماء حتى لا يبقى عالما اتخذ الناس رؤوسا جهالا فسئلوا فأفتوا بغير علم فضلوا وأضل وكما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وحديث من علامات الساعة يعني موت العلماء والأحاديث كثيرة and there's so many أحاديث upon that which the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم I'm not quoting word by word and these أحاديث are authentic brothers and sisters where the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says that Allah the Almighty does not take away this knowledge by taking away this knowledge from the people. However, يقبض هذا العلم بقبض العلماء. However, this knowledge is taken away from what? By the passing, okay, and the death of the scholars. And why is that? In another narration, العلماء ورثة الأنبياء. That 
that the ulama, the scholars, are their inheritors of the prophets, brothers and sisters. They, their position is high. And another in a narration that the ulama, kal qamar ila sa'il kawakib, that the ulama are like what the moon, and comparing them to the people, al alim, yani ma al abid, that the scholar compared to a, a person that worships Allah, a devout worshiper of Allah is like what is like the moon compared to the rest of the stars. There is no comparison because their position is high. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Verily the one that fears Allah the most, the one that has the most piety, is what? Are whom? They're the scholars. Why? Because they know Allah the most. More than the people that worship Allah Azza wa Jal. Because of their knowledge that they have of Allah Azza wa Jal, it, it makes, it instills in them that piety. It's like they have the muraqaba, they're always like, come all the time aware. And they have that basira, that insight. Of Allah Azza wa Jal, His names and attributes, so therefore they fear Him the most, and you can see it within their actions. So the Hadith, when the Prophet Sallallahu says that that this knowledge will be taken away by the passing and the death of the scholars, until there remains what hatta la yabqa alima, until there remains no scholars, over they're very few in number, and just within these past couple of years, brothers and sisters, we've lost at least thirteen ulama from the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah, at least at least thirteen. Being from different parts of the world, they have gone and they are there from the major scholars. Those that took and benefited from the major scholars before them, before our time, before we even came into existence. Now, this is a sign. Until there remains no scholars. And what does that do to the environment, society? It makes the knowledge become less and the ignorance widespread. And then they will take the ignorant ones, those that يتعالم, بالعلم, the ones that show themselves and appear to be from those that have, have knowledge, people will take those ignorant ones as their leaders. And then they will be taken and be put into positions where they will be asked verdicts, questions will be posed to them as if they are the scholars. فسؤلوا, and then they'll be asked certain questions that deserved that needs a verdict from a person that is well grounded and has insight into the Islamic Sharia, but these people they don't, then they will respond and they will give the answers according to their own ignorance, without any proof. And people will take them as their leaders, as the people that they go back to with the God's knowledge. And we see this happening today. Until there remains what? A place where they, those people that are ignorant, that have been given that position, will misguide the people, and they themselves are misguided. And that's the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So it's something that's heavy. And from Al Hassan al Basri, he's mentioned and he said that, that the death of a scholar is much harder and much more severe and heavier upon hearing this news than the death of a whole tribe. Meaning, in terms of if one scholar is gone and from the signs as well, from the other hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says that from the signs of the hour is the passing by and the death of the scholars. Because when a scholar dies, brothers and sisters, you have to bear in mind that what happens, knowledge goes. You don't hear anymore, قَالَ Allah, قَالَ Rasul. You just hear, but we think and I think and this is what it should be and storytellers. And those people that just take the people and they could be people that are well versed and eloquent with regards to speech. But they have no qala Allah, qala Rasul. They don't go back to the sources. It goes back down to them. And this is a scary time we live in today. May Allah safeguard us all and make us from those that are able to go and benefit from the remaining scholars that are alive and to always know our positions. And that's the problem specifically in the West, brothers and sisters, that this is something that is prevalent, that people have taken their positions that they may have been given from the people because of the fact that the people see them to be from those that have knowledge and they respect them, but then they did not remain firm and sincere and they got over or oh, they, they, they became full of themselves. As the Prophet ﷺ says, رَحِمَ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا عَرَفَ قَدْرَ نَفْسَهُ Allah Azza wa Jal will have mercy upon the servant that knows his level. So know your level, brothers and sisters. But the message is not about that. The message rather is about talking about the Shaykh. Who was he? So we begin with his name. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. So his name is 
Abu Muhammad, so his oldest son was called Muhammad. Abdul Rahman ibn Salih, his name was Abdul Rahman, the son of Salih. Al Muhyiddin, from the family of Muhyiddin, ibn Muhammad, son of Muhammad, Diya al-Din, son of Diya al-Din, ibn Abdul Rahim, Al Makhdum, Al Makhdumi. So that was his that, that was his full name. And the Shaykh, he was born in a place called at Tajuri, which was a place in Medina Munawwara. So he was born in Medina Munawwara. In the in in, in on, on the twenty seventh day of Rajab. On the twenty seventh day of Rajab. So he was born on the twenty seventh day of Rajab, the Islamic calendar, in the year thirteen sixty five. In the year 1365 Hijrah. And he died in the year 1444 Hijrah. So roughly the Shaykh was roughly around 79 years old plus. Because of course estimate wise. But he was roughly around the year 79 years old. So he was born roughly in the year 1944 to 46. Because of course when you do the Hijrah and the months obviously is different. But. 1365 Hijrah and he died 1444 Hijrah. And the place Al Hay Al Tajuri, it was a it was a Hay, it was a neighborhood from the neighborhoods of Medina, the old neighborhoods of Medina back in those days. And where it is today, it's on the western side of the building. When you look at the Masjid Nabawi, it's on the western side, next to the Mahkamah. Which there is a mahkamah, there's like a court place on the western side of Masjid al Nabawi. But this hay, so this, this neighborhood was taken down. How or why was it taken down? Due to the expansion of Masjid al Nabawi. Then the Sheikh and his family moved to a hay called Bab al Majidi, okay, which was south of, it was south. Sorry, north of Masjid al Nabawi. North called Hay Bab al Majidi, which was north of Masjid al Nabawi. And this Hay, this neighborhood, that's where the Shaykh he grew up. And he was raised there in that specific neighborhood, Bab al Majidi. And then from there, he entered the school of, you know, how learning to read and to write. And he learned, the Shaykh, he learned to read and write in a place and a masjid called. Malik ibn Sinan in a masjid called Malik ibn Sinan which is known today as Masjid Sayyid Malik Sayyid Malik and then the Shaykh he left that place and he went to study in the Quran study in the Quran so I'm just literally reading the biography of the Shaykh when the Shaykh went on to study the Quran in Masjid Nabawi al-Sharif that's where he began to learn the Quran Masjid Nabawi al-Sharif and then from there, the Shaykh, he moved on to studying in a place called the school of Al-Najah al ibtidaiyya So basically primary school, you call, what you would call primary school. And then the Shaykh, he went on from there to studying in a place from that school, primary school to another primary school called Fahdiyya. Fahdiyya. And this place, uh, this actual school, sorry, takes place, or actually it's located, Bay Raha, in a place called Bay Raha, which is known in Medina. Which is known in Medina. And all of these places that I've just mentioned, they were taken down due to the expansion of Masjid Nabawi. Due to the expansion of Masjid Nabawi. So those that know the history of Medina and Masjid Nabawi know that it had different stages when it was being expanded. So the Sheikh lived in this era. So the whole of Bab al-Tajuri and uh, Bab al- uh, sorry, the, 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 uh, the Hay tajuri and Bab al-Majidi, where the Sheikh grew up, all of these places and the schools and what have you, surrounding areas, they were all taken down due to the expansion of uh, uh, Medina Masjid Nabawi. Then from there, the Sheikh, he went on to join the army. He went on to join the army, subhanAllah. And this was due to the fact that the, his father, may Allah have mercy on him as well, wanted him to join the army. So the Shaykh, he went on to stay in the army from that young age until he reached the middle school in America, which is still, of course, for us in UK, primary school. So he went on to stay in the army until 
middle school. And it was mentioned, and this, by the way, biography for those that are wondering, the sheikh, he gave permission for it to be, uh, for, 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 for those who want that want to spread it. And also the sheikh was also from those that wrote from this, uh, or added to this biography of his. The sheikh, he didn't want to stay in, 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 uh, in the army. He actually didn't want to stay in the army, it's mentioned. But it was due to him respecting the wish and the will of his father. Why? Look at the reason, subhanAllah. Because of the fact he was affected in a good way by seeking knowledge. And he was affected with knowledge. And he didn't want to stay in the army. So the brother that wrote this, he asked the sheikh, how about those people that were in the army at the time? Where are they today? So the sheikh, he mentioned that those people that stayed in the army, they reached a very high martaba, a very high status and position with regards to the army. But the sheikh eventually, um, uh, he wanted, he didn't want to stay in there. And Allah Azza wa wished and wanted for him khair. So the sheikh, he left and he went to Darul Hadith in Medina. He went and he studied in Darul Hadith, which is a very well known, you can say, ma'had. Fanawi, like a high school an institute where people learn the deen and other sciences of, you know, like maths and physics and chemistry and biology and what have you. So the sheikh, he went there. And at the time, subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, the one that was mudir, so this is all in Medina, the one that was mudir or the headmaster of Darul Hadith at that time was Sheikh Al-Allama Al-Muhaddith Umar Ibn Muhammad Fallata. May Allah have mercy on him. So this was the person who was the uh, mudir, the headmaster of the time. And the shaykh ta'athara bihi jiddan. The shaykh was very much uh, inspired by him and he was affected by, in a good way by the shaykh. And the shaykh told me himself that this was from those ulama or the, the scholars that, was, that had a big impact and effect in a good way in his life. Shaykh Umar Fallata, rahimahullah. The Shaykh he didn't complete his studies there in Darul Hadith, but rather he left and he went to a Ma'had I'dad al muallimin So it's like getting the people that want to be uh, become teachers to get them ready. And the Shaykh he graduated there. And from there, from that place, I'dad al muallimin the Shaykh became a teacher. He was appointed and selected to be a teacher. To teach the uh, the you know uh, cultivation and nurturing of teaching and and, 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 and youth. That's where the Shaykh became a teacher. And he stayed there for five years teaching. He stayed there for five years teaching. From there, at the same time, subhanAllah, the Shaykh was teaching and he was a teacher, but he was also seeking knowledge. So he was teaching in that place, in that institute, and at the same time, he was seeking knowledge. Where was he seeking knowledge? In Masjid Nabawi. The Shaykh was seeking knowledge in Masjid Nabawi at the same time. And then from this, it became from the things that wanted or made the Shaykh want to go and study more from the ulama and Jamia Islamiyya. At that time, the person that was the president and in charge of Jamia Islamiyya was Shaykh Abdul Sheikh Ab, Ab, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz. May Allah have mercy on him as well. So these were the beautiful, blessed, golden days, brothers and sisters. Wallahi, I remember many times the Shaykh would tell me that you have not seen, Ya Abdullah, the golden days, the beautiful bliss days when all these ulama were there present and the fitting was less. The trials and tribulations were much less than what we find what is prevalent today. So look at this. Shaykh Umar Fallat rahimahullah is the, the one that's in charge of Dar al Hadith. And Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Ab, Shaykh Abdul Aziz al Baz was the president of uh, Jamia Islamiyya. These are the times when Shaykh al Bani also was from the teachers of Jamia Islamiyya. And so many other great ulama, Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abbad and so many other ulama. So carrying on, it says that. 
that the Jamia Islamiyya was not accepting the certificate and those that graduate from I'dad al-Mu'allimin, meaning the institute the Sheikh graduated from. So the Sheikh he wanted to actually apply and go and study in Jamia Islamiyya, but the Jamia Islamiyya, due to idariya reasons, meaning reasons due to the you know the Tasjil al-Qabul, you know the admission and the student affairs and what have you, and all these you know ad- those political reasons, they weren't accepting the certificate from that I'dad al-Mu'allimin. So what did the Sheikh do? And it was only accept the certificate from those that graduate from high school. So the Sheikh then he said, okay, I will go and I will enter and I will start the high school from that specific one that the Jami Islami accepted. So subhanAllah, look at how much hits, how much uh, inspiration, how much courage and heart determination and how diligent the Sheikh was to get accepted and to study in Jamia Islamiyya. Because he knew that so many ulama and so much barakah would be from, 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 from that university due to the knowledge that was widespread there. So the Sheikh, he would go. He would study in Thanawiyya. He would study in high school Laylan. He would study there in the night time, so in the evening. So the Rasa will start probably after Asr or after Maghrib until after Isha. Okay? Three years the Sheikh did that. So he would be studying in the, he would be teaching in the morning. It's mentioned here, he'll be teaching in the morning. And then in the night time, he will go and study so he can attain that certificate that the Jamia Islamiyya accepts only that one. And the Sheikh did this for three years until he managed to get that certificate and graduate from that high school. And then the Sheikh, he was accepted and he entered Jamia Islamiyya. And where did the Sheikh study specifically? Kulit Sharia. The Sheikh, he entered the Kulia of Sharia. And the Sheikh was asked by this brother, but who was your from your close friends that you used to have in the Kulliya, in the Jamia Islamiyya? And he mentioned the well known Qari, the well known uh, reciter and the leader, uh, Abdullah Jabir, Abdullah Jabir, who, of course, Rahimahullah, we know his beautiful voice and how he was. And the Sheikh, I remember he would tell us stories. I remember he would tell us stories that they would go together. And they'll be together, they'll be like Zumala, very close pairs, very, very close pairs. And they'll both ride a motorcycle. They'll both ride a motorcycle. So the Sheikh, he said that he was very, very close to him, very, very dear to him. They were together. The Sheikh, he graduated from Jamia Islamiyya in the year 1396 Hijrah. In the year 1396 Hijrah. So he was roughly around 31 years old. He was roughly around 31 years old when he graduated. So then he was appointed. So just showing people that it's not never too late to seek knowledge or to study and what have you. You know, it doesn't matter what year you are, you can still benefit. And it's not a must to go to a specific jamia, but you can still seek knowledge for the sake of Allah, sincerely for Allah's sake. Then afterwards, the Sheikh. From there, he was appointed when he graduated and selected to be from those that teach. And he taught in the first in the first faculty that he taught in was the Arabic faculty. And what did he used to teach in the Arabic faculty? And the Sheikh, we know that he loved Aqidah. He taught Aqidah Tahawiya. He taught the famous book Aqidah Tahawiya. And then afterwards, the Sheikh he moved on after two years teaching there to the Sharia, where he actually graduated from. So he stayed there as you know a teacher assistant and teaching there as well until he became a full on full time lecturer there, and then he became a professor, and then he reached the highest level of professor, okay, Ustad Musaid, meaning you know in, in terms of it's higher than being P- PhD, so it's like assistant professor, then professor, professor, and it's like the highest level. So of course he got that, which was in the year fourteen sixteen Hijra. In the year 1416 Hijrah. <laughs> then from there, so roughly he was around at that time, and he's just doing some mental maths now. So in the year 1396, he was 31. 
1416, he was 51 years old, roughly. And then he moved from Kulia Sharia, being the teacher there and the professor and what have you, to Kulia Hadith. And we know that the Sheikh, that's where he ended and he stayed in that Kulia. He was from those, he was from the leaders and the presidents of the, the faculty of Hadith. In, in the specific ca- um, uh, category of Fiqh Sunnah. So that's where he remained the leader and the president of that specific uh, faculty in Hadith Fiqh Sunnah. And then he, he actually uh, retired when he was roughly around 50 years, uh, sorry, six, 60 years old in the year 1425. So he was roughly around 50, 60 years old when he actually retired. From teaching in the faculty of Sharia. And of course, he mentioned the level that he reached up was the highest level that you can reach with regards to qualification. As for his scholars, the Shaykh he mentions here that he studied from, from the great Kibar of the scholars. He studied from Sheikh Imam Muhammad Amin al Shanqiti, Sahib Adwa al Bayan, the one who used to be known for tafsir, who died many years ago. And he learned from him in Masjid Nabawi. And he recorded many of those tapes back then. It was, you know, the VHC, the, the tapes back then. And the brother he asked the Sheikh, Do you still have these tapes? And the Sheikh said, Yes, he still has them. And he studied from Sheikh ibn Baz. From the books that he studied from Sheikh ibn Baz was Kitab al Tawheed and Masjid Nabawi. And he studied also from him many other books. And he studied Usul al-Fiqh from Sheikh uh, Atiyah Muhammad Salim. And he studied from Sheikh Umar Fallata. And it's mentioned here that he says that he was from the ulama that impacted and affected him the most from the shuyukh in terms of his, his character and his the era that he had around him and you know that, that aura that he had and how he was as a person, Sheikh Omar Fallata. Because of the fact that he stood firm upon the correct aqidah, the aqidah salafiyya, and you know, warning against the innovators and what have you. And he studied also from Sheikh Abu Bakr Jazari, Sheikh Abu Bakr. He studied from Sheikh Abu Bakr Jazari, rahimahullah, also. He studied from him tafsir and other things. And the Shaykh, he says that he was affected by the way he used to be and treat the people, how he was with regards to his mannerisms and how he used to always remind the people. And he also studied Shaykh Uthman ibn Ali uh, al Dawadi. He studied from him as well. He studied from him Fara'id. And the Shaykh, he became very well grounded in Fara'id and he was known. Many of the brothers that know and benefited from him and I've seen from the Shaykh how much, how well grounded he was. With regards to Fara'id, I used to ask him, Sheikh, how do you, you know, how do you calculate the inheritance and just manage it just when you get thrown figures at you and people and what have you? And he says, it's very easy. He said this, I enjoy it, I love it, so therefore it's very easy. It's very easy. And the Sheikh, just to add the point, the Sheikh, I remember he informed me that he memorized the manduma that's known in the maturn of, of inheritance and he memorized it in class when he was in studying back then when he was a student and he, Sheikh Albani, rahimullah, was a teacher at the time, so he asked the Sheikh, who knows who's memorized it, the Sheikh told him, and he read all of it to the Sheikh, and the Sheikh was just, you know, ecstatic and happy to see that Sheikh Abdul Rahman memorized it. So the Sheikh, he was very, very serious and diligent with regards to his studies. Going back from those that he benefited from. Until he, he, he memorized and he studied from the Sheikh, who is Sheikh Uthman ibn Ali al Dawadi. Fara'id, he memorized and studied inheritance and studied from him and benefited from him until he became from those that also teach inheritance. In Masjid, in, 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 uh, in Medina Munawwara. And it was known many times the Shaykh would be called just for that because he was very well grounded and Allah gave him the tawfiq to be able to, you know, become grounded and well versed at it. And he also studied from uh, the Allama Ammar Al Azar Al Jazari from, from Bukhari, Sahih al Bukhari. And he studied Hadith al Sharif, he studied Hadith 
from Shaykhana Shaykh Hamad al Ansari, specifically Sunan al Tirmidhi, in Masjid Nabawi, and he was also affected, and he had a you know a, a great uh, uh, had a great impact on him, a, gr- a good impact on him, Shaykh Hamad al Ansari, in terms of how he would search for certain things and do. You know, he was very, very much diligent with regards to research. And we know the Sheikh, those that knew the Sheikh, we know. I know the Sheikh to be from those that he used to love to research. All the time he used to be reading. You know, he used to ask many brothers to go print him books and, you know, search different topics and different subjects. And he was very much well, he, he used to like literally love being a library, a walking library, because he used to always be from those that research about stuff and reads into things. As for the Shaykh, in terms of how he was with his creed, we know that he, of course he was from Ahlul Sunnah and Jama'ah and he studied so many books and he said that he studied also from Shaykh Muhammad Aman al Jami'i. He studied from Shaykh Muhammad, Aman, Shaykh Muhammad bin Ali Aman al Jami'i. He studied from him. Okay? He studied from Shaykh Aman ibn Ali al Jami'i. He studied from him the books of Tawheed and the books, the books of Aqeedah. And he says that how he, the Shaykh, he's talking, the Shaykh Abdul Rahman Muhyiddin Rahmanullah was talking about Shaykh Muhammad Aman, saying that he studied, he taught so many books of Aqid that people of innovation used to hate it. And hence why he got a lot of, you know, bad and negative vibes from them. Some of them even to the extent, you know, the story where they tried to attack him in Masjid Nabawi. Tried to attack Shaykh Muhammad Aman in Masjid Nabawi. He studied Ufa from Sheikh Abdul Abdul Rauf Al Lubdi. He studied from him Nahu. He studied also um, some 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 scholars from Egypt, Sheikh Muhammad Amin Al Misri, Sheikh Mahmoud Al Tahan, or Sheikh Mahmoud Al Mira, or Sheikh Sayyid Al Hakim. And also he, he didn't study from him specifically, but he attended some of his muhadarat, some of his lessons. Um, Sheikh Taqiyuddin al-Hilali, he, ben, he benefited from some of his lessons and some of his reminders, but he didn't actually study from him specific books. And of course we know that he also studied a lot and he was very close to uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr. Al uh, Jazari, who who eventually became his father-in-law. As for the Sheikh, with regards to his, you know, his uh, da'wah and his how much uh, hard work and how how diligent he was with regards to teaching, then the Sheikh Tabarak al Rahman, rahimahullah, rahmat al Wasi'a, Allah Azza wa Jal gave him a love, brothers and sisters, for teaching and spreading knowledge. It was something that he gave him a love. So of course we know that he taught uh, and he used to do lessons in the places that we mentioned, in the institutes and the kulia. But also he used to go out to teach. He used to go out to teach. So the Sheikh is mentioned here that He went from literally all the areas of the place that he could go to for da'wah in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And we know that he traveled and he went to places in Europe. He went to places in Europe to teach. From the books that he from the from the books that he authored were He wrote, and the majority of them were actually uh, Rasail. Um, he wrote on the Risala of Aqidah Suhiha. He's got Arba'in on Nawi, which Alhamdulillah we completed and read on him. And it's very beneficial, beautiful book. He had books in Farah, he had Rasail in Farah as well, in Kitab al Fitan from Sahih al Bukhari. 
where a person should put his hands with regards to uh, after a court. He's got also Risal and Jarhu Ta'deel, Ta'rif Bi'a Immat al Sunnah, Juhud Mamluk Arabiya, you know, the, that which Mamluk Arabiya put in terms of spreading Islam. Uh, he's got a book on Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, Rasul al Sunnah, Fadl al Islam, Tirmidhi as well. And these are from the books, and he's got so many other books from his students. From his students, then we know the Shaykh, he taught so many. But from his students, then we have... It's mentioned here that when he was asked by the brother, he said he's got roughly around 30 that he can remember on top of his head. But he didn't mention them all. From them, Shaykh Sulaiman al-Ruhayli. From them, Sheikh Abdul Salam al Suhaimi. From them, Sheikh Ali al Tawajiri. From them, Sheikh al Doctor Tarheed al Dawsiri. Sheikh Musa'ad al Husseini. From them, Sheikh Fuad and his brother al Amri. And so many other, uh, so many other um, students that he had. So that's me just summarizing from the Arabic language the short biography of the Sheikh and I'd just like to mention and point out that I'm, I'm probably not even giving it it's right with regards to mentioning that biography because of the fact that there's so much more but of course it was just something that was summarized and written by a brother may Allah reward him, reward him and make him from those that uh, gets reward of those that hear this in the English language so I thought instead of writing it and typing it translating it it's best just to make uh, a video for those that want to listen to audio so that's from the life of the Sheikh now, there's bits that I'm going to add on that I myself um, managed to hear from the Sheikh himself. And subhanAllah, I mean, where do I begin with the Sheikh? Sheikh Abdul Rahman Muhyiddin, rahimahullah. It was such an emotional time for me to hear, subhanAllah, that the Sheikh passed away. Allah arhamhu, Allah arhamhu, rahmatan wasi'ah. And all the ulama and all the Muslims that passed away. And may Allah Azza wa Jal cure the Muslims that are ill. Now, the Sheikh, alhamdulillah, by the tawfiq of Allah Azza wa Jal, I met the Sheikh roughly, I would say, I think it was the year, if I'm not mistaken, the year 2018, the end of the year 2018 um, is when I was, I met the Sheikh, meaning became close to him. But when I first came to the Jamia in the year 2012, I managed to sit with the Sheikh a couple of times on occasions when he was just answering questions and he had the lesson. But of course, the lesson, it was the same time after Maghrib when Sheikh Muslim Abbad would have a lesson. So I managed after the Sheikh Muslim Abbad would finish just before the Adhan of Isha, I would go and I would listen to Q&A. And I saw from the Sheikh, subhanAllah, I just had this thing where straight away from those that know the Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, you can tell he was just someone where you would just love to be around. Just because of the way he was, he'd always have a smile on his face, rahimahullah. So eventually, alhamdulillah, in the year 2018, um, I went to the Sheikh, alhamdulillah, and I asked the brothers if I can speak to the Sheikh and inform him about something. And I think that thing, for me, it was, it, it was such a personal time. The first time I actually became close to the Sheikh and the Sheikh, I told him who I was. That I think it's best for me not to mention it uh, because it was such a personal touching moment. Such a personal touching moment. So eventually, alhamdulillah, after that event, I started uh, um, sitting with the Sheikh and he was teaching at the time. I remember the Sun, uh, Sunan al-Barbahari and Alhamdulillah from the moment I st started until the end Alhamdulillah we finished from that lesson that book and there were other books that were read onto the Sheikh from the brothers that were reading onto the Sheikh and there were so many people that used to come and they used to know the Sheikh but I remember the first time I ever saw the Sheikh walking and the brothers said to me in 2012 this is Sheikh Abdurrahman Muhyiddin because I have heard I had I did hear of, of him I went to try to give him salam and I gave him salam but subhanAllah there was this sense of the aura around him that where he had this strong shakhsiyah 
a strong شخصية, a strong, a strong character that I was kind of, you know, nervous and I tried to kiss him on his head. And of course, he didn't allow me to do so. And the Sheikh, subhanAllah, he just had this around about him that from that day, I thought, Allahu Akbar, you know, the Sheikh is, I wish I can benefit from him one day. And that was in 2012, but I never got the opportunity. I never got the opportunity until the year 2018. So we're talking about all those years later. Alhamdulillah, when we started sitting with the Sheikh, we just saw from him every single Monday and Thursday, he would fast. That's the first thing, brothers and sisters. So a lesson. And I don't want this just me to be rattling on and just wittering on and telling you, but rather take benefits from that which you hear about the Sheikh. And this is how we should be because Alhamdulillah, Allah, one thing that I would tell you from the ulama is not about getting close to them or being with them or saying, I know this or I was with that Sheikh, but rather the knowledge that you're able to benefit from the Sheikh and then what you carry it, what you carry away from that and how it impacts your life. And that's something that it should be because they are the inheritance of the prophets. They are the, from the inheritance of the prophets with regards to knowledge. So the Sheikh, every single Monday and Thursday, he would fast. And he would come and sit in the place where, and I remember at times, I remember specifically when Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi, Hafizahullah, would be given fatawa, the time of Hajj, and it was the year roughly around 20, 2013, 2013. And then the Sheikh Abdul also, he did the same thing. And he would, so he would have Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi here on this section, and Sheikh Abdul Hamdin on that section. And they would both just be answering Q&A, from the phone calls they were getting. It was something, the project of the, that the Masjid Nabawi did, which they still do up until today, where they have the ulama inside the Masjid, they can take Q&A, and also those that want to ask from the Hujjaj, they would also answer their questions. So every single Monday and Thursday, he would come, and that specific spot is where he would come, and he would sit down afterwards in 2018 now, when the Sheikh would go there, break fast, and then the lesson would be straight after Salat al-Maghrib into Isha. So that, that was a period of time in the beginning time where I would start seeing the Sheikh, his characteristic, how he would be from those that, you know, is consistent with the gospel of fasting, Monday and Thursdays. And then the Sheikh would have this smile and he would ask about, so I remember the first time he asked about me, what I'm, where I'm from and what have you, and he made du'a for me, he would always make du'a for me. Sometimes he would grab me, make du'a for me and do this. You know, the Sheikh, he just have that fatherly love, you know, that grandfather, father love. That he had about him that he just loved. He wanted khair for someone. He wanted khair for you. That's what he wanted. Just want khair and just move on. Khair and move on. You know, I'll give you that which I have from knowledge and I'll just move on. Subhanallah. But it happened to be a thing where the relationship grew to more than just that. Between me and the Shaykh, alhamdulillah. And the Shaykh, eventually, he, I was informed by another brother, uh, another brother from Libya, who informed me that the Shaykh teaches after Fajr. So now I thought to myself, wow, Allahu Akbar, this is an opportunity. The beginning I thought, shall I start? Because, you know, if I start, I don't want to stop. But alhamdulillah, by the tawfiq of Allah, Azza wa Jal, Allah made it easy for me to attend the lessons. And he was teaching tafsir from, and this was after Salat al-Fajr in Masjid Nabawi. From Imam Shakir, rahimahullah, he was teaching tafsir. So the big, thick red book, that those that know how the book looks like. So that's the book that the sheikh, that the brother was reading on to the sheikh. And it was literally maybe, you can say, three of us or five of us that were attending. So one uncle, I remember him, Amma Mahmoud, rahimahullah. And those that knew Amma Mahmoud, knew him, may Allah have mercy on him. And then the brother that was reading myself and maybe two other guys. So then the brother was started reading on to the Shaykh. And I remember I joined when they were on the last stages of Al-Imran, going on, sorry, uh, yeah, Al-Imran, going on to Nisa. Astaghfirullah, they were on Surah Al-Nisa. They were on Surah Al-Nisa. They were literally there, but they read some bits and bobs from that which the brother wasn't there for the lesson, Al Imran. And then as they started on Sultan Nisa, I got the book and I was just starting taking down notes. The Shaykh, he would, it was amazing. Many times would come there, and these are from the benefits we take, brothers and sisters. The Shaykh, subhanAllah, he was from those that were prompt on time. The Ghassah Salat al Fajr, he would come and he would tell him, I remember one time I asked him, and the Shaykh, he told me, May Allah accept it from him, Ya Rabb. That he said that he would come and he would be there an hour to an hour and a half before the Adhan of Fajr. He would be there in the masjid, praying salah, reading Quran and doing dhikr. So that's when the Shaykh would be there. And the, our lesson, remember, it begins after the Salat al Fajr. After the after Salat al Fajr, the lesson will begin until we would stay there until sunrise, every single time, until sunrise. And then the Shaykh would pray Salat al Duha and then we would leave and the Shaykh would go. And not just that, look at this, the Sheikh would go home 
and then he would take that which he needs from his family members, that which he need, that, that which they need, and then he would have breakfast with them and what have you. Then he would come back to Masjid Nabawi and he would teach because the Sheikh at that period of time when I was with him, he was teaching in Masjid Al Nabawi in the Kulliya. That's where he was teaching, and the Sheikh would stay there. So just now, I might as well. I've started. I might as well. So I've started the time. He would reach the Masjid Nabawi from that period of time, an hour to an hour and a half. Before the Adhan of Fajr Not before Fajr But before the Adhan of Fajr He would be there And then we would have our lesson of Tafsir Which would take place after Salat al-Fajr Until sunrise Every single day without fail Except for of course The Friday and the Saturday Because the Friday and Saturday The Sheikh he would do what? He would travel outside of Medina most of the times For da'wah purposes With his other peers and the other, the other Sheikhs And the other scholars He would travel outside of Medina To go to the different villages and teach them so he will start, the Sheikh will travel, and then he would be there, he would do a khutbah, and then he would do reminders and what have you, and then he will come back on the Saturday night. And then the Sunday, it will begin. So from Sunday to Thursday, the Sheikh will be there in Medina. So when the Sheikh finishes the lesson, he will go home, get what he needs that his family members need, have breakfast with them, come back to the Masjid Nabawi, bearing in mind, of course, he's got children, all of them have grown up, except for his young two kids that are a bit younger, below the age of 15. His youngest two, I'm talking about. And then he'll come back to the Masjid Nabawi. As soon as he comes back, he teaches until Salat al-Dhuhr. And then I remember, alhamdulillah, the times that Allah made it easy for me, where I had a break, I would come to Salat al-Dhuhr, uh, uh, Masjid Nabawi, and he will be there. And I remember the, the place he would pray in, subhanAllah, when you go from Bab Quba on the left, and he will be there. And Salat al Salat al Dhuhr will be the place that he prays Dhuhr Salah after he finishes teaching. As soon as he finishes, he would always pray the Sunnah. He finishes praying, and then he would leave. And then he would go back home, and after time, he would have Raha. And then the day doesn't end there. So it's just knowledge after knowledge, making it for the Salat, the, for, for in the Masjid Nabawi, to do these stuff, to teach knowledge, to spread. And to be around, and Sheikh, he said, he used to say to me many times, he loves students of knowledge. He loves those that love knowledge. Because that's what makes the connection, knowledge, having love for knowledge. The Sheikh, he'll come back to the Masjid Nabawi, and what would he do? He would come back before the Salat al-Maghrib. And he would come back into the Masjid. And then, of course, if it's a Monday or Thursday, he would come back and he's breaking his fast. If it's normal days, then you would see him for Salat al-Maghrib. And then he's got his lesson again after Maghrib Salat, where the brothers read another book. And then, there will be two brothers reading. And then afterwards, he would stay there until Salat al-Isha. He would pray his sunan, and then he would go back. And that was the Sheikh's timetable, brothers and sisters. So I'm talking about from the ages of after 60s. Because obviously I mentioned that he was teaching in, 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 in up until he retired. Until the age of 60, then he was teaching. So I'm talking about 2018 times, brothers, all the way. And of course, the timetable was the same. Before I had had the permission that he granted me to study with him and to benefit from him. So the brother with regards to the tafsir lessons, he carried on reading, he carried on reading, but because of the fact that the brother was graduating, or he had graduated, he had to travel. And then there was a time when he left and he traveled. And of course, at the time, it was so amazing because the things that he would say, take this for benefit as well, uh, brothers and sisters listening, that the sheikh would say that with regards to the salah, that the Imam should try and make the people, you know, be reminded of the ayat. So he should make his beautify his voice in a way where it's if he reaches the ayat of adab or punishment, then he would make his voice a certain way. If he reached the ayat of, you know, uh, naim, something that is a, a blessing, ayat of bushra, ayat of you know glad tidings, then he should make his voice a certain way as well. And the Sheikh said that this is important for for the people that are praying to be. To have to be to have that effect or to be impacted or to to be to take that admonition of the of the meanings of the ayat by the imam's voice, and sometimes the sheikh when we would be doing tafsir and then the sheikh would say one thing to us. I remember he says, "How better than to start your day by praying salah in jama'ah in this masjid, in this blessed masjid, to hear the reciting of the imam and then to learn the meaning and the and the and and the tafsir of." The words of Allah Azza wa Jal. He said, what better way? And we'll be like Allah. And the Shaykh will be like Allah Akbar. So sometimes the Shaykh, when it would be ayat that were, you know, affected him, he would then explain them to us before the brother reads the book. So the Shaykh did this on occasions. 
and straight away the Shaykh will go straight into the uh, uh, into the meanings and then he will derive benefits as well and will ask him questions as well during the lesson and then the Shaykh will give benefits from that which he benefit from that which he Allah made it easy for him to give benefits and the Shaykh Allah, you could tell he's just someone that wanted to swap to spread khair and many people would visit him and those were the times that were blessing many people visited him one time we had a majmu'ah a big group of the Algerian brothers coming to visit him another time the, the brothers from from Riyadh another time brothers from certain parts of Africa brothers from parts of Asia brothers will just come and the Mu'tamirin as well that will just be there and they'll just sit in the lesson and just benefit from him and then I asked the Sheikh one time I remember specifically I asked the Sheikh I said Sheikh you know when you're people are around you, how do you manage to just, you know, make them love the sunnah, I should say, make them love ilm. And he says, first and foremost, Abdullah, this is the tawfiq of Allah Azza wa Jal. Secondly, I look at the people and I try to give them that which they want with regards to knowledge. I try to make knowledge love be something lovable. So I try to make their hearts attached to Allah. And that's something that I picked up. It's like the Sheikh wasn't after followers. The Sheikh wasn't after people to love him for who he is. or what. It was just after just making them love the deen and make them love Allah Azza wa Jal. So that's why the Sheikh he had this good sense of he was people he was a people friendly. He used to people used to feel that they can open up to the Sheikh. So then the Sheikh, after some time uh, of the Sheikh, you know, explaining the book, the brother had to travel. So now I remember specifically on that day when the, the Sheikh told the brother he had to travel. I came the next day and I thought maybe the Sheikh would just explain and carry on. But what was uh, about to happen was for me personally very daunting for me. Um, because the Shaykh he asked me to read. He said, Hey Abdullah, and to Abdullah, you're going to be the one that's going to read Yalla. Continue with the uh, with, with reading. And of course I'm not the I'm not the strongest. I'm not the strongest with regards to reading and what have you and the grammar and you know it's something that's daunting. And I, I'm 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 a person where I get very nervous. And the Shaykh he had that subhanAllah rahimahullah, he had that character about him that already I feel shy in front of the Sheikh and I'm nervous. But now me having to now concentrate, trying to put all of that together with regards to concentration and reading and what have you, I was like, Sheikh, I can't do it. I, I said it to him, I said, Sheikh, and I said, but the Sheikh was like, no, I said, no, you're going to read, I want you to read. But for me, it's like, I didn't want to tell the Sheikh no, but at the same time, I didn't want to read because I wanted just to, because I wanted just to concentrate and benefit. But the Sheikh was like, no, you have to read. So I saw that as like, okay, I don't want to say no because it's rude. So maybe it's going to help me, inshallah. And the Sheikh, subhanAllah, one thing I mentioned, brothers, is that he had this sense of, he was like a mentor. It's like he, he, he maybe he already knew that I was nervous and what have you. So he wanted to get it out of me and be like, look, this is ilm, read. So the Sheikh, he taught me. And that's one thing that I benefited from him the most. May Allah Azza wa Jalla reward him and, 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 and have mercy on him is that, he taught me how to do everything with regards to when I was next to him and things that he saw that I needed to perfect and what have you. So he will teach me, for example, the way you, I, I, I should read, the way mannerisms of reading in front of a shaykh and alim. And he'll be like, Ya Abdullah, can ulama'na, can, can ulama'na yu'allimuna. And you know, our teachers will teach us how to read, Ya Abdullah. The teachers will tell us to do this and it'll be like this and be like that. And, the Sheikh was just about nus, 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 advice, advice, advice. It's like this, it's like this, like this. Ya Ibni, Ya Ibni, Ya Ibni, Abdullah, Ya Abdullah, Abdullah, Ya Muhib, Ya Muhib, oh beloved one. And this is the way the Sheikh would address me and the brothers around him. Oh beloved one, Ya Muhib, Ya Muhib, Ya Abdullah. And it was like, subhanAllah, I, tr I benefited tremendously from the Sheikh. Tremendously. Like words can't even begin for me to describe. Even this, what I'm telling now, probably is going to be something that I'm giving. A pinch of salt, literally, of how much I really benefited from the Sheikh. So carrying on, uh, I, I remember it was so still Surah an Nisa. So I would have to read this ayat as the brother would do, and then the explanation, and then the Sheikh would give annotations and give benefits and derive benefits from the that which he had he 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 he, um, he had heard from me or from the brother before me. So we we'll do this, and the brothers would attend, and what have you. And I remember we carried this on, but the Sheikh, I remember the brother as well, he, 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 he would read also from the Sheikh's um, uh, uh, Magister, that which he did for Magister in Tirmidhi, the, the brother would read that, and it was literally something that he printed off, it wasn't something that was a book, it was printed off, 
and he would read that after the tafsir. So there's two books that were being read. So now obviously now it's just one book. By the time the Sheikh says, okay, has the book finished, he would just take questions and what have you. You know, he would just take questions from that which we're doing. You know, other questions, people ask him questions. Maybe he would give time to the people that were around him to ask their questions. So the time was little more, it was much less. So at the beginning of the time, the Sheikh would always correct me if I make a mistake. He would always um, give the benefits and he would tell the story. He would explain the book. And then I remember the first time the Sheikh he saw, I remember that day because I have hyperhidrosis. So excessive sweat. So when I'm nervous, I sweat excessively, like excessively. It's like a, a pool. So I remember the time, subhanAllah, um, the Sheikh he saw this from me. So then he, after the lesson finished, he said, he said, and this is something that Abdullah, I'm not doing to put you on the spot or anything like that or to shame you, but rather I want khair for you. And I'll never forget that day, Allah. He said, I want khair for you. I'm not putting you on the spot or anything, but rather I want khair for you. So the Shaykh, when he did this, it was so emo- I was so, I was so taken back by his words because I, I literally, he didn't have to tell me that. I saw that already. But for him to tell me that, subhanAllah, and I remember afterwards I messaged the Shaykh and I said to him, Shaykh, and I obviously I didn't say no because, but rather because of the fact that I was shy. And he goes, no, don't be. You know, no, don't be, carry on. So then it carried on me reading to the Sheikh and after Fajr, and then it reached a time, I think maybe the third lesson, I asked the Sheikh, I said, Sheikh, uh, do, you, I, I, do you give me permission? I would like to, um, you know, if you permit me to and you see that it's a benefit and I can, and you see that I'm capable of doing it, I want to read Arba'in and Nawi on you. So the Sheikh said, yeah, of course, no problem. So obviously now for me, I wanted to make life easy for myself. I got the matter and I started reading. And the Sheikh says, no, no, Abdullah, you can't just read the matter straight away. First read about the author and what have you. But of course, I tried to avoid this. <laughs> you know, I tried to avoid this. That's what I tried to do. I didn't want to read the actual, you know, the author and his biography and what have you, because I wanted to get straight into it. Once again, it's just something that I, as I am a person, you know, I was just nervous. So the Sheikh said, no, no, Abdullah. And subhanAllah, he said, look, take my car keys and go to my car. And he told me where he parked his car. Obviously, I knew already by that time. He said, and open the boot and get the copies of Arba'in and Nawi. So I thought it was going to be just Arba'in and Nawi. I didn't know, obviously, beforehand that the Sheikh had actually printed his books and it was there. So I went to the car and subhanAllah, a big package went, came back and I gave it to the Sheikh, the car keys in the package, and he said, give it out to the brothers that are around. And it was only a couple, maybe six at the time, six, seven. And for me as well, the less people attended, the better it was for me because the less nervous I would get because I know everyone's around me. So um, I got the book and, I, and the Sheikh said, begin from the beginning. So it was literally a biography of the Imam Nawi and what have you. I just read who it was. And the Sheikh added notes of who he was and this, this, that, his, 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 his you know, short biography. And after doing this, after doing this, we began, alhamdulillah, by the tawfiq of Allah Azza wa Jal, we completed Arba'in al Nawi, and we didn't even complete it in Masjid al Nabawi, we completed it in Masjid Quba. That's another thing I forgot to mention. The Sheikh would go to Masjid Quba every now and again on a Thursday because his brother would actually invite him. So sometimes it'll be Masjid Nabawi for Maghrib Salah, and, some, and usually on a Thursday it'll be in Masjid Quba. And I remember the brother informing me that he would go there, so he would leave and would reach there for iftar, and then the Sheikh, he would hear the older brother. Subhanallah, Allah Rahimu, uh, Abdul Rahim, who passed away as well, which impacted the Sheikh greatly in his last years because they were very close, Subhanallah. And one thing I'll never forget, which I picked up on once again, Ikhwani, is something that I hope, inshallah, you all pick up. The Sheikh would always make dua for people, all the time. Like he would see me, he would make dua for me. He would see the other brothers make dua. His brother, he would, they would always have jokes, you know, just general, general banter and what have you, you know, they'll make jokes upon each other. Listen, Abdul Rahim, leave me, I've got a lesson. Allah, may Allah Azza wa Put you in Jannah Tafidus Ayla. Inshallah, we're going to meet in Jannah. Uh, inshallah, your kids are going to be in Jannah. Inshallah, you're in Jannah. I can, I can, inshallah, you'll be from those that are in Jannah. Inshallah, Abdul Rahim, listen, stop, Abdul Rahim, stop, stop distracting me. I've got a lesson. May Allah give you Jannah. We we'll talk to me, I'll talk, I'll talk to you after. So it was just this sense of, you know, brotherly love that they had for each other and the fact that the Sheikh would always make dua. The Sheikh would always make dua for the people around him all the time. And Subhanallah, uh, I just remembered as well an event occurred when I actually met the Sheikh after 20, because I remember I said 2012, and then I would just see the Sheikh every now and again going to lesson. But there was one time when um, I remember specifically um, I was with Sheikh Rabbi coming into the Haram, and at that moment of time, it was roughly around 20, I'll say 2015, 
six, 20, let's say 2016, 17, 26, 2015, 16, um, Sheikh Abdurrahman Muhyiddin came in. I knew who he was, obviously. And then Sheikh, Sheikh Rabi came in and they were in the front, in the beginning part of Masjid Nabawi and they met. And then they had a conversation and they made dua, how are you, how are you doing this, this, that. Made dua for each other and then they gave each other salams and then they left. I remember these, these are the moments, subhanAllah, that it's, you could just tell the ulama they had respect, mutual respect for each other. They, you know, they knew who each other were in terms of, you know, people and what have you. And anyway, so going back, so to the lessons, the shaykh, he carried on. So we started, alhamdulillah, we, min- we finished in Masjid Quba, Arba'in and Nawi. And the shaykh, he used to always at times bring dates. And he used to bring special dates that he used to love. And I remember those dates were from the most beautiful dates. And I remember he would bring them and he would bring them in a box, a c- container, a plastic container. And he would also bring his tea and his, and his shai and qahwa. And he would tell me that his family made it for him. And then he would come and then he would be poor. Then he would, I remember after Salat al Isha, uh, Maghrib, whether it's Masjid Nabui or it's in Quba, he would ask for the tea to be poured. And when the brother was reading, at times I would pour it for him. So I would pour the tea. And I'll pour the I'll pour the coffee as well. And then he would like give the rest of the brothers. We'll give them also from the teas that they'll have cups as well. He would have zamzam. So remember the sheikh used to drink zamzam and he used to love it. So I remember we'd get the cups. We'd get the small zamzam cups. It would be like maybe five to seven cups. I would get him just so that if he needs to read. And these are from the things that the sheikh is. He would ask me, Ya Ibn Abdullah, khudli moya, khudli moya, or this is yalla subli al qahwa or shay and give tamar to me. Give the rest of the brothers. But these are something that I'm, he's indirect, indirectly teaching me mannerisms, how to be with the teacher, because these are from the mannerisms that I picked up, alhamdulillah, and I benefited tremendously. That when someone is teaching in front of you, you should have these things around him. And these are, of course, from the ulama. So for me, it wasn't a thing where he, he even needed to tell me, because it's like, that's the very least I can do. You'll give me this knowledge, and you're my, you know, my grandfather's age. May Allah have mercy on him, Sheikh Abdul Rahman. And I just used to love it, the fact that I would give it to him and pour it for him. But it's about mannerisms, how he would be, how he would be around the people around him. Sometimes he would obviously, this is an old age, he would sit for so long, at times his legs will hurt him and his thighs. And then he would ask the brothers, can you please excuse me, please forgive me, I'm going to stretch my legs out. But he doesn't even need to ask, you know, because of course we have respect for the sheikh. But once again, mannerisms, brothers. You know, as the Prophet sallam, says, Verily I have sent, been sent down to perfect Mannerisms. So carrying on, the Sheikh he would carry on, and that happened for years. And eventually, the Sheikh got ill, and there were times when the Sheikh wouldn't be there. And those moments, Subhanallah, were moments where, Wallahi, brothers and sisters, I tell you, it was you felt that sense of emptiness with the gospel because the lessons were it, it was interactive. The Sheikh was very, very interactive with his students around him. Very interactive. It wasn't just a thing where he would come and teach professionally, and he's a teacher, he's getting paid for it, he's going back home. No, he's coming out of his own time. He could come and be in Masjid Nabawi. And read Quran and what have you But he's coming and he'll be there And I remember he would tell me He'll be like if you guys don't come Then alhamdulillah I'm, I'm going to be busy with the Quran I'm going to be accompanied and busy with the Quran But subhanallah brothers and sisters One thing that I benefited from that him saying is that Is that one shouldn't feel lonely If they know that Allah Azza wa Jal is there You can call it on You can call to Allah ask, Make dua to Allah Supplicate to Allah how can you be lonely if you live with the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu in terms of his seerah and what have you? And how could you be lonely if you have the Qur'an, the words of Allah Azza wa Jal? You can recite it 24-7. Make that be your companion, meaning the Qur'an, because it's going to be an interceder for you in Yawm Iqra' al-Qur'an fa'innahu ya'ti yawm qiyamah shafi'an li ashabi. Read the book, as Prophet Sallallahu says, read the Qur'an because it will come on their judgment and intercede for you. Point being, the Shaykh, he you know, carried on this time and he would be from those that were uh, teaching. And I remember, subhanAllah, um, w- um, when, when he was ill, he wouldn't come to the masjid. But then we'd call him and then we'd see the brother would call him. And at times, and then we'd see how he is and say, alhamdulillah, he's better, he's getting better. But he would always be sad when he wasn't able. And I remember he would tell me that I'd always be, I feel sad, brother, when I can't come to those places. because. And then he would say one thing and said, when I see you, he said, wallahi, I don't I said, for example, today I was very, very ill, very, very sick. But wallahi, when I see you guys coming and attending and being ready, it gives me that energy and buzz to come as well. Because of course, the student, when they are energetic and enthusiastic, it makes the teacher also energetic to prepare for the lesson and to come. There's moments when brother, I remember one brother, subhanAllah, who I met eventually, eventually in Samita in Jazan. He came over from Samita in Jazan and he gave a book, he gave a big carton, a big one, I remember, to the sheikh and he gave it to him as a present, Salat al-Fajr. 
after the lesson and the Shaykh he told me to go and put it to the uh, in his car and then the Shaykh also said Abdullah get something from the car and subhanAllah it's like he's you know this is the karam that I was talking about he had that generosity always ready for anything and he said get something from the car so he gave a box to the brother and had books on it and said give this to the Mashaykh in Jazan and give them my salam or the ulama there in Jazan so the Shaykh he had this you know uh, sense of generosity so alhamdulillah those are beautiful blessed moments in Masjid Nabawi I remember at one point he told us as well that um, the story when he, when it was many years ago, the Mu'addin came late and uh, when the Mu'addin came late, there was no one there and he was there. And then they made him go and do the Adhan and he stepped up and he, this was back in the days when they used to actually go in the, on the top bit of the minaret. So he would go in the top bit of the minaret and he would actually make, and he made the Adhan there. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was him or his, or Sheikh Abu Bakr Jazari, um, his teacher. But if I'm not mistaken, the story was that it was him. And he told us that story. And he told us that one time he, he was led salah by the Sheikh Abu Bakr Jazari, rahimahullah, his teacher. And um, it was beautiful because the Imam wasn't there because the Sheikh was also, he said the Sheikh used to always be early and he was never late for Salat al-Fajr. So that's something that I remembered. And it's like he said it, it impacted him. From the things that he told me, I remember he said, because I asked him at one point, you know, who was close to you from the, who were you close to, who, 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 like, affected you the most? And he said it was Sheikh Abu Bakr Jazari because of how he was, how kind he was, how generous he was. People will speak about him and what have you, but he was still just wanted to teach and spread knowledge. So they said that impacted him. He said Sheikh uh, Umar Fallata, he said it impacted him a lot as well. Very close to him, you know, he had this sense of love for the Sunnah and Tawheed and Aqeedah. So he said he impacted him a lot and taught him a lot and he had a big effect on him. And then I remember the Sheikh um, at the time when it got a time when he was sick. At that time, he became better eventually. And Alhamdulillah, the students, they traveled, they went back. And those next two years, Alhamdulillah, I stayed in Saudi. So I managed to actually uh, um, visit the Sheikh in his local masjid. And, you know, you know, where he lives in his house. And I was able to get close to the Sheikh. And the reason I'm telling, telling you this is all because I saw the Sheikh now in a different you know, place where it's, you know, it's literally his masjid in his house. So alhamdulillah, those moments were beautiful moments. I remember the sheikh at one time, I said to the sheikh, sheikh, I'm, I'm going to bring my kids because, you know, my kids, they, they didn't want to let, it was a time when, obviously it's the holidays and, you know, they want to be with me. So I took, I remember my, my, um, my, my um, two kids at the time. I took my two kids, my two oldest kids. I took my girls and when I took them there, the Sheikh, he said, uh, he made dua for them. He said, you, you remind me, Abdullah, of, of when I used to ride my daughter on a motorcycle. So he said, I used to take her when I used to have kuliya, I would go and take her to where she needs to go in terms of school. And then I myself would go to, to, to study and I pick her up. And he said, you remind me of that. And I said, subhanAllah. And I said to the Sheikh, make dua for them. The Sheikh would make dua for them. And then alhamdulillah, I remember when Yunus, my, my, my oldest son, was born, he made dua for him. And one of the brothers that used to read on him was also called Yunus. <laughs> and subhanAllah. Um, and obviously, the Shaykh he made dua and then eventually, alhamdulillah, he saw him, he made dua for him and what have you. And he used to have, alhamdulillah, lessons in Qiblatayn, in uh, Masjid Quba. And, you know, uh, he used to have like little muhadras, like reminders and what have you, lectures. So I remember at one time I asked the Sheikh about how his life was before and he said that Alhamdulillah he was actually an Imam beforehand many, many, many years ago in, um, in Quba, if I'm not mistaken as well, Qiblatayn. And he was offered to be the Imam of the Haram, Masjid Nabawi, but the Sheikh rejected. So I asked him, why did you reject Sheikh? And he said, Abdullah, everyone knows themselves. He said, that, that was the position that I didn't want. And subhanAllah, I just, you know, I understood what I understood from that. You know, that the Sheikh, he wanted just to, you know, seek knowledge and be with the ulama, but he didn't want to get that position. So the Sheikh was very, very humble. Very, very, very humble, the Sheikh. You know, in terms of his timing, brothers, you know, I remember at one point I said to myself, I'm going to try and get to the masjid before the Sheikh. <laughs> it felt, I failed every single time. There wasn't a time when I came. I remember one time I came, I couldn't see him at first. I couldn't see his shoes. And I thought, alhamdulillah, today I made it. You know, Salat al-Fajr, I made it before him. I went and I see him in the corner reading. I was like, Allah, you know, and it was a thing where I couldn't even compete. I'm supposed to be this shab, this young youth, young, you know, man. And he's supposed to be in his late ages, 
But I remember it was something that he became, he taught his body to be persistent and consistent with regards to that. So he was very prompt. One day, and this is something that inshallah you can all benefit. Um, I asked the Sheikh, Sheikh, and I remember after Sultan's Fajr, I was like, Sheikh, you know, with regards to Qiyam al layl praying the night prayer to Hajjud, how can you, you know, be, how can one be uh, diligent? I remember one of the brothers asked him, one of the brothers asked him, and, you know, how can one be diligent? So, alhamdulillah, I've managed to benefit. And the Sheikh, he said, one can be from those that praise Qiyam al layl number one, by sleeping early. And of course, making dua. Make dua. You have to make dua from Allah, because this is from the tawfiq of Allah. And then he said, you have to sleep early. Number two, try and not eat heavy meals in the nighttime, at late. Try and be from those that does, doesn't eat heavy meals. Number three, be from those that try your utmost best to have friends around you. Because I remember one brother, he added, he said, but Shaykh, sometimes when you want to sleep early, the brothers you know, start to make fun of you or this, this, that, or why are you sleeping early? He said, he said, Alhamdulillah for me, I had friends around me that we would also compete. But the last one to come to this lesson has to buy us breakfast and, and so on and so forth. So the Shaykh, they're competing in Tasabaqoon fi Khairat. You know, they're literally competing in khay, in goodness. And then the Shaykh, he said that, so we will try, so if you do this and you sleep early, and you know that sometimes, even if you're tired, you say to yourself, get up, pray, it's time for salah. You know, this is a time when Allah said, how can one sleep? Knowing that Allah has descended, you know, to the to lowest part of the heavens. And it's a time when he says, from those that ask for my forgiveness, ask and I forgive you. For those that want me ask something those that need help and seek help in me and so on and so forth the hadith you know and then the sheikh will be like these are the things that help a student you know in terms of being much more better is by praying qiyam al when the people are sleeping so then the sheikh he, he gave that benefit and then he also he said that doing things like you know always reading the quran always asking allah azza always ask allah ask allah and make dua make dua inshallah allah will give you the tawfiq the sheikh brothers and sisters um, that time when I managed to see him in his hay and what have you, he was loved. He used to always be from those that give reminder and remind people. When I would come for Salat al Asr, because he would, Salat al Dhuhr, usually he would pray in Masjid Nabi, even if he's not teaching, or even if he's off. He said that Salat al Dhuhr, he tries to make it Masjid Nabi, and that's what he used to do. And the brothers, they would try and read a book on him and here and there, but then the Sheikh, he would allow them to, and he would, he would, he would never say no. Someone that wants khayl, he would never say no. The Sheikh, he had this. He was very much, he had this uh, good insight in people. He had that farasa. So he'll be able to read someone if they want khair, if they want sharm, what have you. MashaAllah, the Shaykh, he was so beloved. He was so beloved. People loved him. And the, 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 for Salat al Asr in his local masjid, built that knew where he lived. And alhamdulillah, because of where I lived and I moved house, it wasn't far from me. And so when I would just literally go through a drive after Salat al Asr, and that's where sometimes we'd have the lesson as well. He would teach and give a small reminder before we read on him, uh, Arba'in, where we sometimes used to do the lesson there as well. We would read on him, and after Salat al Asr, literally, he would give a small reminder, and then the brothers, and then, and then we would read. Alhamdulillah, as well, when he became a bit old, the brothers that we used to read in Masjid Nabawi, we ended up reading on him there in his local masjid, in his local masjid, which eventually, Alhamdulillah, moved to his house when the Sheikh got really ill, and the benefit was, and the Sheikh was so hospitable. I remember one time, subhanAllah, he even, uh, you know, um, gave us food and what have you. And the sheikh would always tell us to eat and give us benefits. The sheikh just used to always want benefit. From the benefits as well that I picked up from the sheikh was about how to be with this phone. This phone that could be of benefit or could be of something that leads you to destruction. The sheikh would be like, yeah, Abna, you're my children. Make, control it, don't let it control you. The sheikh would be like, at points, at the time, I remember he would tell me, Abdullah, at that times, when it reached a certain time, the phone switched. And it was known, the sheikh, that after Isha, if you tried to ring him, and I tried, I remember the brother told me, and I tried, you can't get him. The phone will go off. You put it into open mode, or it will switch off, and then he would open it afterwards, whenever he wants. He said, when I come and I read the news and what have you, as for always being on available and, you know, social media and what have you, said, this is not something that it comes of benefit, so limit it. He said, I tried to limit it, and I tried to keep up with the news, what's going on around me and what have you. Um, the Sheikh, subhanAllah, I remember when he got to his last stages, he did become ill. And I remember even also from those that I remember the incident that happened. And when he, the Sheikh, there's no need for me to mention exactly what took place, but the Sheikh, he was obviously rushed to hospital. 
and he was put there. And the brothers visited him. He became ill, and that's when I actually uh, met his children as well. Beloved children, they loved him so much. And one thing as well that I picked up, Subhanallah, is that when I was with him, and there will be times when the Sheikh would come, and then I would tell the Sheikh that, listen, Sheikh, there's no need for you to drive your car. I'll come and pick you up from your house, and I'll take you to the masjid, and I'll bring you back, because I wanted the Sheikh for it to be easy. And I even offered as well at one point, Subhanallah, to drive the Sheikh to the masjid. But the Sheikh, because of how gentle he was and how kind and how much he thought about his his children, his children, that's because he saw us as his children. He didn't want to burden. He said, Abdullah, ma arid anafkar alayk anta inda ka ila wa abna. He said, Abdullah, I don't want to burden you and be heavy upon you because you have children and you have this. I said, no, Sheikh, I don't mind. You know, so then he would let me drive him just from his house and message, but to, to message Nabawi. He didn't want to burden me, subhanAllah. And this is how much the Sheikh, he was, he was, he had, he cared for his children and his, and his students. So I would ask the Sheikh, Sheikh, and I, you know, this is something for benefit for the sisters. I'll say to him, and also for the brothers, I'll say to him, Sheikh, now how could, if, 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 if a mother wants to memorize the Quran and benefit, how can, how can she do so with having chores, having to, you know, look after the house and this and that? And then the Sheikh, he said, Abdullah, the way to do it is that the husband has to help her. The husband has to help her. He says, he said, for example, take your children at a time when your wife wants to memorize the Quran or benefit. And when you take your children, use the opportunity to tell your wife, okay, memorize at this time and then I'll listen to you afterwards. He said that he would do that. And the Sheikh was very much a family person. He loved his family and the family loved him and the people loved him. SubhanAllah, that's the tawfiq of Allah Azza wa Jal. May Allah accept it from him that which he put forth in his dunya. And... I'll tell the Sheikh Allah it's a great benefit. And the Sheikh said that if you help out by doing that, that time your wife can what? Memorize the Quran or learn things as well. And I remember at times when I would uh, come to the lessons, you know, he would care. Let's say I, would, I remember one time I was late in Masjid Nabawi. He's like, Abdullah, fain, fain kunt Abdullah. And I said to him, Sheikh, and I will lie, kunt ma'iyan. You know, Sheikh, and I'm sorry, forgive me because, you know, uh, forgive me and pardon me. I was with my children. And that was the time I remember my, my, that, alhamdulillah, that my... Uh, my, my, my wife had uh, graduation, what not, from this institute and what have you. So the Sheikh, he cared. He would always ask, Abdullah, thank you. Well, I remember, I think, two to three times. I remember that. I think it was two to three times. The first ever time, Salat al-Fajr, I was late. And obviously, I'm the one reading at that time. So as I'm late, subhanAllah, ghalaban in norm of, you know, sleep overtook me. And then I was late. Alhamdulillah, I prayed local and I came straight. I want to remember uh, when I, that, that, moment the sheikh goes ha ah, abdullah ta'akhkhart al-yawm ha al-yawm ta'akhkhart yani lazim al-yawm yani al-fatur alayk abdullah he will like abdullah you today you're late so today definitely you have to buy us breakfast you know and this is how the sheikh was subhanallah the sheikh was like this and then another time i remember uh the sheikh he he um i was late another period of time, another time and then to obviously teach me my lesson he said today you can't read today the brother's reading you can't any yani, come and come jump in and be late and read Today you can't read, the brother's reading. So alhamdulillah, it made me be like, okay, next and I can't be late. So it, these are the things that I picked up from the sheikh in terms of how the sheikh was. And I remember on one point, Qadrullah, at this event, I'm so upset that I missed it because I was not well. Um, they invited the sheikh for breakfast and the sheikh went and he gave a reminder and what have you, I remember. And, you know, the sheikh, he was very, very hospitable. Very hospitable. Another time I remember the sheikh, I asked him about, you know, children. I said, sheikh, and I, you know, I've got three kids now. You know, what do you advise me? How can I keep up with having the three kids, looking after them, seeking knowledge and all of this stuff? You know, the Sheikh said, Abdullah, yani every single person, I'll say it in English, every single person that tells you looking after children or being a father is easy. He said, Wallahi, it's no, it's, 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 they, they, they have lied. Wallahi, they have lied. Wallahi, they have lied. He said, because Abdullah, having children and looking after children is something that is difficult. It's not easy. It is not easy at all. Sorry for those that, didn't, uh, let's say the lighting wasn't good, forgive me, but I didn't want to stop it. He said, Abdullah, looking after children is not difficult. It's actually very, 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 it, it, it's not easy. It's very difficult. It's tiresome and it's a big responsibility. And then the Sheikh, he said to me that, um, he said to me that I asked him for advice. I remember asking him for advice. So then the Sheikh said, He said that I advise you to be diligent and to be a father that's always around and to be with your children. And he said that always advise them. He said, play with them when they're young. You know, when they're young, play with them, be with them. 
be gentle towards them. And subhanAllah, this is not the thing as I mentioned, it's not something that the Sheikh just mentioned just like that. But rather, I saw him himself be with his what? And be with his children. And just to give you guys what I mean by that, but he said, play with them when they're young, be with them. You know, when they reach a certain age of, you know, when they're like about to reach the age of puberty before that, you have played with them and been with them. When they reach a certain age, then they'll be able to confine in you. They'll be able to literally, they'll be able, they won't hide anything. They won't conceal anything. They won't hide anything from you. They'll always be open to you because of the fact that you were, you were nice with them when they were young. And then when they reach a certain age, they will, then will look after you because you looked after them and you were kind with them. And inshallah, whatever you give them of, of advice, he said they'll go through stages. They'll definitely go through stages. Prepare for that. They'll go through stages when certain things would happen. But inshallah, because you were young, when, when they were young, you'll play with them. They'll listen to your advice. It might be difficult. You might have to challenge, but, but they'll listen to you. And before I mention the story, I remember the sheikh, he mentioned something to, 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 to me. I remember specifically and to the brothers. He said that, he said that, he said, Abnai, children, be advisors and don't be people that, you know, uh, force the deen upon, you know, down people's throats. Be people that advise, be gentle, be kind. You know, don't be from those that force. The sheikh was never like that. He was very gentle and kind. He said, I'll give you an example. He gave us an example. He said, one time I saw a man, a young shab. We parked up, I was driving and then traffic lights, we were next to each other. So he was smoking. And when he saw me, he was, you know, a bit, you know, a bit shy to do that in front of me. So I said to him, what are you doing? You know, you have that cigarette. And he said to me, you know, he couldn't really answer. He said, look, give me some if it's got any benefit. For, for If it's of benefit, give me some of that. And this is, the, you know, he's indirectly giving him da'wah. Of course, the sheikh doesn't need it. He doesn't want it. A'udhu billah. But he's giving him da'wah. He said, so when he gave us that example, he said, when I asked him, he said, if, if there's any benefit, give it to me. He, he, was, he became so, like, uncomfortable that he took it away and he threw it. So this is this is an examples. It's, this is an example, brothers and sisters, that we have to be gentle when it comes to da'wah. You know, as Allah mentioned in the Quran, as Allah mentions in the Quran, that if you were what harsh, you know, and tough with them, then they would what and they will leave your 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 your, your gathering and they will leave you, and then. As for the him give, give me advice with children, at one point I remember I was driving. I remember and the sheikh he, he I look I reached his masjid, and then the sheikh he came with his son. When the sheikh he came with his son, we had the lesson and his son was there. And he told I remember he would he would have the lesson. His son would give me salam. Very very beautiful, um, very 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 cute little boy. <laughs> May Allah preserve him. Subhanallah. Um, he was with us. He gave us salam and then. Afterwards, and this is something as well for the fathers, try your best to always be with your children when they reach that certain age, your sons specifically, to be with them, to take them, you know, to, in, in those places where there's other men around and it helps them as well build character. So the Sheikh, he would tell him to go read Quran, so he would go and memorize his Quran. SubhanAllah, I remember at one point, I, le I remember when I left him, months went by and then he was on Surah Al Kahf. So he had only, a, you know, half left or even less. And then he was just memorizing, memorizing. So the Sheikh, he said to, to me, obviously, to be kind. After the lesson finished, I remember we, I got up. I remember that time. As I left, I saw his son. And he, the Sheikh was in the car, so I thought, what's going on here? Did the Sheikh, um, is the Sheikh going to get something? Did he tell him to wait for him? And then literally, and I saw this two, and I saw this twice, I think, not, not once, but twice. If I'm not mistaken, two to three times. Yes, two to three times. The Sheikh, he got in the car. And obviously where he lived, he made the U-turn with his car and then he drove and that's, the masjid was here, the house was here. So he, he made the U-turn to drive and then his, young, his, his, his younger son, who at the time I think probably I would give him maybe 11, 11 years old roughly, probably now probably, probably 13, around there. Um, his son started running. So basically, his, the Shaykh, Shaykh Abu Muhammad Hiddi, he was racing, <laughs> he was racing his son, subhanAllah. In a car, he was in a car and his son was what? On foot. And this is just, it's small things like this, but they go a long way. And the Sheikh, he still had this in him at the age of late 70s, touching 80. You know, he still, he knows the importance of giving your child some attention, some time, playing with them. It goes a long way bit because it makes them love you. So of course, when the Sheikh and I see him at a time when his son would see him, because, you know, he, he, he loved his son and his son loved him. 
So seeing this, it kind of set, gave me also, you know, ideas of like, subhanAllah, what gave me, I was like, subhanAllah, this is a sheikh, alim, you know, he's a teacher, but yeah, at the same time, you know, message to all those that teach, you can still be with your family normal and just be that father figure, you know, or that mother figure, love them and be around them, be kind towards them. I remember one thing that I picked up from the sheikh as well, uh, um, for all the brothers that are studying out there, you know, that leave their wives, you know, you know, in, in between four, four wards and their wives suffer and what have you, it's not right, it's not on. I remember every single time, uh, most of the times, a very few moments, and there I can count in my number, it wouldn't happen. The sheikh would always go with his wife and his children to the Masjid Nabi. If his children can attend, obviously they didn't have homework and what have you, you would see that I would see his son with him. And if his son wasn't with him, his wife would be with him. And he would take his wife to Masjid Nabawi. And subhanAllah, these were from the things. And I remember one time I, I remember one time I asked him about I, I asked the Shaykh and he said, he had to hib and to salim, he had to hib and, 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 and ta'ti maya. And he'll say that to me that you know she loves to come with me to Masjid Nabawi, she loves to come and attend and pray Masjid. But I'll tell her, Yalla, get ready. You know, he said that I, I said, and then one, I remember one time he even told me, he said, Abdullah, you know, how you should be with your wife and stuff like that. He said that when we'll be in the car. I would read onto her, I would read Quran, it would be of benefit, I would tell her to fast, I would read Quran onto her, and she would listen to me, she would have the Mus'haf. And it's like the constant, that constant, you know, having that family of knowledge is what the Shaykh was trying to basically get at and try to tell me that I should try to do the same thing. Because it was it was amazing. You know, all the time the Shaykh was prompt and his wife would be there, the Mishnah Nabawi. Okay? Because of course when we're going to the car, we would leave and then you know he would pick up his wife. From a different bab, you know, obviously, uh, out of respect, would always, you know, give the sheikh. And when a mission Quba, same thing, we would see the fact that the sheikh would wait, or his wife would be there, his wife would be there already waiting at the car. And these are from the things that, why I'm telling you all, for the brothers that have their wives studying, it doesn't have to be a thing where you make her hate knowledge, you make her hate that environment, make her love it, include her in it. You know, these are from the ulama that we should take from there, the inheritance of the Prophet. You know, and point being is that I just wanted to give this small, quick, you know, biography of how the Sheikh was. You know, I remember all the time the Sheikh would always tell me to come and invite me. When COVID hit, I remember subhanAllah, well, that night, that morning, Fajr, we went to read on him. When when they made, I remember when I was there, when they made the rule that no one's allowed to read or whatever, no one's allowed to go to the halaqat and it all closed. We went and then I didn't read the news and the brothers didn't read the news. And I remember we were supposed to read on him and then the Sheikh was like, you didn't hear what happened. We were like, what? And the Sheikh, he showed us. And then he said, no one's allowed to read. No one's allowed to think. And then we were like, Sheikh, man, you can, you can't. He said, listen, this is from the thing. We don't want to go and, you know, disobey our, uh, you know, the ruler and that which he put forth with regards to our health and what have you. So subhanAllah, the Sheikh, he was, and I remember every time I've come, whether it's Masjid Nabawi or Quba, or it's there in his local masjid, if it's before the lesson, I would find the Sheikh reading the Quran. The Sheikh was busy with Quran. He was reading the Quran. And the Sheikh, when it will come, when it's his local masjid, the time timing will be different. So after so for Salat al Fajr, it would be that it, he would read in Toshiruq. He would read Quran in Toshiruq. And then afterwards, or at least just before it, and then we would study with him until that which he was able to stay with us. And he would um, uh, let us tell us, you know, that's enough for today. And then we would come the next day. And he would, I remember he would advise the Imam and give him a wa'id and stuff like that. He was very, very diligent, the Sheikh, very loving. From the things that, you know, I benefited from the Sheikh and the Sheikh, he wanted to make me uh, more prompt and organized and what have you, is that he gave me the task. And subhanAllah, there's something that, alhamdulillah, I, I, you know, uh, it was a pleasure for me. It was a pleasure and honor for the Sheikh to choose me to do that, is that I would, I would get his medication from that which he needed from the, 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 not hospital, but I'll say clinic in Jami Islamiyah. So I'll be the one that would get his medicine and, you know, um, all of that which he needed. He'll give me the prescription, his name, his file name, his number, his details and what have you anyway. And then I'll go and pick it up for him and I'll give it to him. So every single time I'd come, for example, if let's say he, he needed something, Ya Abdullah, Jitta Dawa, Khat Dawa. So the Shaykh had the way, even just me thinking back, SubhanAllah. Uh, brothers and sisters, it's just something that he was so gentle, so kind, so nice, so loving, so loved, so beloved. And he, he, and whenever he would speak to me, he'd be like, "Ya Muhib," 
Oh, beloved one. That's, that's how it would address me sometimes. All these things I picked up, there was something that was, you know, I, I benefited from him tremendously. I benefited from him tremendously. The Sheikh also, um, you know, he would be very, very emotional. He would get emotional at times when, let's say, it's a hadith that's been written, that, that I read on him, or one of the brothers read something on him, or an ayah, and he would get emotional. And the Sheikh would stop there and you just see him, you know, putting his head down and getting emotional. Alhamdulillah, also from the Dawrat Ilmiya, I remember he did Sharh Sunnah as well, and his local masjid, the brother read on him, and it was very beneficial. You know, uh, so many people attended. Alhamdulillah, even those times as well, once again, the Sheikh, you know, I saw his character. So I remember I would uh, drive him to his, 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 from his house. I, once again, I have to be on time, I have to make sure I be on time. And Allah made it easy for me, Alhamdulillah, he doesn't live far from me. And, you know, take him there, take him to the lesson. And, you know, um, the, the, the Sheikh then eventually, he, he, whenever he would see my car, he gave it a name. He said, Dabba, which obviously, you know, uh, more or less the meaning. But so I remember one time, I think my car it wasn't working, what have you. And I'd be like, Sheikh, or something happened to the car, Sheikh, forgive me, I'll, you know, I'm late because of this reason, whatever. He goes, ah, it's fiha. What's wrong with the car? He goes, Marida, manda biha. Ha, tawadiha ila al mustashfa. <laughs> like, you have to take it to the mustashfa. And he goes, yeah, and he, Marat fil qalb or batan or rats, mada. So I'll tell you, is, it, is, the, is the car, does it have an illness on its head or its heart or its, or, or, or its tummy? What, what's, the, what's the problem? You have to go give it, get, 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 get a prescription from a doctor, so obviously he's a mechanic. And the sheikh was just, you know, he has this, this, this sense of humor that he had in him. You know, the sheikh would always be, you know, kind. He'd always, always check up on me as well. And the brothers that he knew, you know, uh, I remember when he had a um, beautiful uh, lesson with, with the, uh, I remember it was Sheikh Fuad or Sheikh Hussam al Amri, I remember from the Cape in Jeddah. And the Sheikh said that he, he, he he's happy to see from his students, you know, those that are teaching and stuff like that. The Sheikh just wanted khayr. He just wanted people just to spread knowledge and whatnot and just to teach. And I remember uh, my point, subhanAllah, that the Sheikh, you know, subhanAllah, you know, me even mentioning all of this, subhanAllah, just bringing back memories, subhanAllah. Wallah, just bringing back memories. May Allah Azza wa Jal have mercy upon the Sheikh. May Allah Azza wa Jal have mercy upon the Sheikh. The Sheikh was, he was something else. Wallahi brothers and sisters, he was something else. Something else. And his words can't even describe. He touched people, he, he touched people's hearts, you know, in terms of the way he was with his words and knowledge and what have you. You know, I remember an event of a brother came to seek, seek advice and the Sheikh, he advised him. And the Sheikh advised him on certain things that even the brother got emotional. You know, so many times the brothers got emotional around him and the Sheikh, he, how he was, I remember he had visitors coming from all over and he would advise them. They would ask, where, where can we meet the Sheikh? We want to come to see the Sheikh. The ulama from our country have, have, wants to, have given salam to the Sheikh. You know, all of these beautiful moments, subhanAllah, were, I mean, words can't describe it. One thing I remember happened to me was during COVID times was that my car, the engine, um, basically came to its end date, expiry date. And so what happened was, the Sheikh, he said to me, Abdullah, um, meet me at this place at this time or whatever, in terms of the lesson. And then I said to him, Sheikh, nah, it's going to be difficult. I might not be able to come. I'm going to come. So Sorry, I, I came. I remember I came. I took long and I came and I got Uber. I said, Sheikh, I'm saying, you know, the Uber, the, the car, it took long to come. I said to me, what do you mean? What do you mean car took long? What happened to your car? Uh, so I tried to avoid, Sheikh, alhamdulillah, but you know, so it happened next day as well. So Abdullah, listen, if, if it's difficult, don't come. I don't want to make it a burden. That's how the Sheikh was. So if it's difficult, don't come. And I said, no, Sheikh, that's okay. So at one point I said to him, then he asked me, can you come? And I said, Sheikh, I'm going to go to the mechanic. He said, what's wrong? I said, the engine. So then I said to him, okay, Sheikh, what happened is the engine is gone, basically. Okay, the engine's gone. I need to get another one. So I said, I'm going to get another one, inshallah, next week, Sheikh, because I went to the place where they sell it. They said that I can't get it from that place. I have to go to the... It's a place where you can... It's basically a scrapyard because my engine specifically, we couldn't find it, my specific model of my car that I had. So the Sheikh, he said, he rang me. And listen to this. He rang me, the Sheikh. He said, Abdullah, I'm going to come to you. Be ready at this specific time. So I was like, okay, Sheikh, I'm I was ready. And then he drove, he said, come, come in my car. He drove me in my car. And then he went back to his house. He said, wait for me in the car. So I wait for him, waited for him in the car. And then he said, Abdullah, here, take this. He gave me a number. I was like, Sheikh, I'm I was like, Sheikh, what's this? 
He said, take it and fix your car. And then he literally gave it to me and then he drove me back. To, so instead of just, Khan said, come to me, he drove, picked me up. He took me, took me to his house. When he took me to his house, he gave me an envelope. He went back to my house, took me, drove me back to my house. And this is my teacher, my sheikh, subhanAllah. And then he gave me an envelope. Brothers and sisters, I kid you not. 5,000 rials was equivalent to 1,500 pounds. He gave me cash, just like that. I was like, Allah, he, thinking back at it, it's not even about the money or whatever, it's just the fact that he cared. He could have given me 500 rial, he could have given me 20 rial, 10 rial, but it's about the fact that he cared. But he gave me 1,500 to 500, 1,500 pounds roughly, cash in hand to fix my car. He said, I said, Sheikh, it doesn't cost this much. I was like, Sheikh, please take the rest. I know it costs this, this amount. I think maybe, I think I remember I got a quote of two five. So half of that. He said, listen, take it and the rest, the rest keep it. Buy presents for your children or whatever. He said, keep it. I was like, subhanAllah. I was taken back by it so much that I, I, I couldn't even, and I'm only mentioning this now because the Sheikh, of course, he has passed away, rahimahullah, may Allah accept it. But I didn't know what to say. I, did, I said to him, Sheikh, like, Aslan, I don't need it. I said to him, and it doesn't even cost this much because I, I literally I told the guy I'm going to give you the money and he said to me, it's going to be ready on this day. I said to him, Sheikh, I already booked an appointment and everything. I already gave him a deposit. He said, take it. He said, and he said, and he goes, said, take it. I'm not asking me, take it. I was like, subhanAllah. I remember I made so much dua for the Sheikh and I was like, this is a alim that cares. This is someone, an individual that cares. He's not just here for me to be his student or whatever, but he cares. And there's nothing between me and him. I'm just someone that came from, uh, came from Halston, you know, a boy that came, grew up in London. And, and I was like, subhanAllah. May Allah accept it from the Sheikh. Yeah, that day was just something else for me. It was, it blew me out of my mind. Literally, I, I, I didn't have anything, I couldn't explain it. So, those are from the things that me showing you his generosity. And I remember many times as well, I've seen individuals around him that have came from outside or in Medina. He's given them something. You know, they meet him, he gives them something. You know, of you know, to help them out, and he said that Sheikh said that this is, he loved to help out his students. I remember even I remember he informed he informed me that with regards to the end of his life when he was getting older, he said that he told his his sons that you know in terms of that that which he owns of provision and you know his books to give it away and he wants everything to go so the Qajari he doesn't want to keep anything. He said he said all of that which I have even the house everything give it away, you know because he doesn't want to have anything that which he has an extra he doesn't want to keep it. Subhanallah, this is how the Sheikh was. One beautiful moment I shared with the Sheikh, and I'll never forget this day, was Sheikh and Sheikh Ad Muhsin Abbad. So Sheikh Ad Muhsin Abbad was ill, and it went for a period of time where he wasn't teaching. So Sheikh Muhammad Muhyiddin, I remember that day specifically. Um, I was in Masjid Quba. I remember I was in Masjid Quba, and I was with him, and we were reading and whatnot. We finished reading, and then when we finished reading, the Sheikh said, Abdullah, have you heard? Sheikh Ad Muhsin Abbad, I said, yes, yes, I've heard Sheikh now. He said, um, I've tried, I'm trying to ring him, but he's not picking up. I think he's trying to ring his grandson or his son, Sheikh Abdul Razak. He tried to ring him, but no one was answering the phone. So he said that I told him I'm going to visit him. I have to visit him. This is from the Wajib. Who are, yeah, any, uh, and I said that he's our teacher. We have to visit him. You know, it's must be. Yeah, 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 visiting the sick is important. So I was like, subhanAllah, look at how he was. How he was. He wanted to make tafdiq of the hadith from the rights of a Muslim upon you is what? That you visit him when he is sick. So the Sheikh said after Salat al-Isha, he said, yeah, hey, Abdullah. But I was, I, I didn't know what he meant in the beginning, you know. I thought maybe he just wants me to take him to his car and take his books, which was the norm. We'll take his books to the car and he, and he's, he would come like with a little, uh, like a little trolley that would have dates and tea and, and coffee, coffee and other things, you know. And he had the dukka as well, the thing that I, I, personally, I don't really like it, but like a little powder that they would dip dates and whatnot. And the, 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 those beautiful moments, Allah, I miss them. Anyway, so the Sheikh said, Abdullah, get in, jump in. So I jumped into his car and he said, do you know the way? I said, Sheikh, and alhamdulillah, I know, I know where the Sheikh Musa Abad, where he lives, exactly his house and Sheikh Abdul Razak in the masjid. He goes, are you sure you know the way? I said, yeah. The Sheikh is very organized. He didn't like to be late. He didn't like to be, you know, get lost. Of course, you know, at that age as well, <laughs> I don't want to be messing up anything. So alhamdulillah, I knew the way. So I directed him from Masjid Quba. I go to him, Sheikh, and I drive towards Jami Islamiyah and then I'll direct you. Because of course, I know the Sheikh, he knows. So then he drove towards Jamia Islamiyya, as that's where the Sheikh Musa Abbad lived, alhamdulillah. Um, you know, so we drove, 
as the Sheikh was driving, I was speaking to him. Allah, it was just benefit, nothing but benefit. I was asking him for advice. I was asking because I was coming now towards the end of my years, you know, my last year, roughly about a year and a half to two. So, um, you know, I'm asking questions, benefiting him, uh, benefiting from him, asking him so many things. What did you do this? And what did you do then? What did you do this? What did you do then? And then, alhamdulillah, um, um, with regards to, and then obviously I've left my car there as well. So, driven now. And then the Sheikh, he says to me, you know, um, so many things is, like I said, I don't even want to mention so many of them because like so many benefits anyway. So as we've driven now, we're driving, I've now got close to the uh, place. There was an exit, a place where you can enter into the road that would take him to Sheikh Musa Abad. But that road now was closed. So I didn't want to take him through that. I didn't want to, <laughs> didn't want to mess up anything up. So I've now taken the right, you know, before you get to, the restaurant 99 for those that know it before you get there so i've made the right we've come in we've driven past sheikh uh abdul bari uh his masjid and his house the ansari the son of sheikh Ahmed al ansari so the so now the sheikh's you know son's teacher we've, we've made the left we've gone i made rights and lefts and rights after we made like three rights and lefts he goes yeah abdullah Allah Huh? He goes, Abdullah, may Allah guide you, don't know what the place, where's the place? The Shaykh's obviously now, you know, um, getting annoyed at me because I've made him do too many turns. It's as if I don't know where I'm going. But to get to the Shaykh Musa Abad's house, because I didn't want to take him through the main road and then the Ben Akawi, then the U-turn, I wanted to take him through the quicker way. But that shortcut ended up being a long cut, as they say. Um, so now I've made left, right, left, right. And then alhamdulillah, I've made dua now, ya Allah. <laughs> Make it the fact make it easy for me that I actually do know where I'm going and I'm not leading the Sheikh into a wrong place because obviously it's after Salat al Maghrib but before Isha, so the Sheikh wants to give him salam, finish, and then I remember I think the Sheikh said he wanted to pray Masjid Nabawi afterwards. So, subhanAllah, this is how the hits the Sheikh had. He wanted to just do what he needed to do and then leave. So, anyway, we've got there, alhamdulillah, but just a Sheikh and I had the whole bait Sheikh and Masjid Abad and I had the Kalyameen. You know, this Sheikh and this is the house, the Sheikh's house on, the, on your right hand side, on your right. This is where his house is. I got him Sheikh and I had a and so yeah, then we got out of the car, I rang the bell, he said go ring the bell, I rang the bell like three, four times, no one's no one's answering. Like no one's answering literally. And obviously the Sheikh, the number he's got, no one's answering as well. So he's, we stayed in the car, he's ringing, he said, ring the number, we rang it, no one's answering, pressing the bell, pressing the bell, pressing the bell, no one's picking up. And then I thought to myself, what are we gonna do? So I, so the Sheikh goes, yeah, any Mumkin Narjim and Allah Sheikh any Ghail Mujud. Go to, so Alhamdulillah, Allah made it easy for me. I said, La, that Shaykh, Alhamdulillah, Shaykh Barzak Mawjood. Ibn Uyan Yaskun, Yani Bijawari. I said to Shaykh, Shaykh, I said to Shaykh Rahman, Alhamdulillah, Shaykh Musa Abad's son, Shaykh Barzak lives right next to him. He said, Do you know where the house is? I said, Yeah. I said, Okay, yalla, go knock at the house. So I went now, the Shaykh's in the car. I went, I knocked at the door a couple of times, no one's answering. Alhamdulillah, the last time his son came out, Shaykh Barzak's son came out. And I remember I recognized his face. And then when he came out, I said to him, I got him, Yalla, hey, yeah, Sheikh Muhammad Mawjood, and you read the Zur al Jid. I got him, hurry up, hurry up, and come out. He's a young, young boy. He said, Sheikh Muhammad, Sheikh Rahman is here, Muhyiddin. He wants to visit, he, he wants to visit your grandfather. And then he goes, he goes, okay, one second, because I remember the son, he had, he had, Subhan, look at how the ulama's children are and how they, I mean, how he was obviously raised. He was basically wearing the Izar. He said, one second, I don't want to go out like this. Just give me one second, my phone. Just please give me one second, make sure the Sheikh doesn't come and see me. I said, okay, no problem. Then he went, he put his phone, whatever. He gave salam to the Sheikh and he said, Sheikh, I'm tafadl. And then the Sheikh, he didn't go in straight out of respect, obviously, entering someone else's house. He basically um, stayed outside. So I was literally just behind him. And then um, as he stayed outside, he's gone into the house. We've gone into the house now. As we've gone into the house, he's we waited in a room. And then they brought Sheikh al Muhsin al Bad inside on the wheelchair. <coughs> And then the Shaykh, subhanAllah, you can see the happiness in his heart. Even Shaykh Musa Abad, the smile that they both put on their hearts as soon as they gave each other salam. The Shaykh kissed him on his head, gave him salam. Shaykh Rahman kissed him on his head, gave him salam. And then, subhanAllah, they kissed each other, they hugged each other, you know. They gave each other that mutual respect and hug, you know. And then they straight away, Shaykh Musa Abad, as he sits, his hey, how he is, start asking question. And Shaykh Muhammad Muhyiddin said that, we heard you're sick, you're not well, what happened? He goes, Alhamdulillah, I'm okay, I'm better now. Whatever, I went, I had checkups and whatnot, I'm better, Alhamdulillah, you know how it is. And then Shaykh Muhammad Muhyiddin started asking him, how's everything with you? And then they, started, they just literally started reminiscing their life. They're like, remember, and they started talking about um, Sheikh Ali Hudayfi, their Qari, 
how he graduated from the university, graduated from, then they started asking each other, how's this sheikh, how's this Fulan, how's that sheikh? You don't, you don't, don't you remember, he used to be in that, he was that one in that classroom, and he was the one that graduated, he's the one that did the doctorate, he's the one that had the munaqasha, he's the one that I sat with, he's the one that benefited from, da-da-da-da, how's everything? And they just went on and on and on and on along, but I was just literally just there, just sitting there. And the Sheikh Abdul Rahman, look, look at the mannerisms he had, he didn't forget to introduce us, so he introduced me, and then obviously when he introduced me, uh, uh, he introduced who I am and the brother that was there with me and he literally just um, uh, and then I remember when he said my name because it was like Sheikh Musa said uh, Ibn Khamis and I said yeah my father's name was Khamis and he goes you remind me of the person in Riyadh who's called Ibn Khamis he was known and he goes oh subhanAllah he goes because it's, it's, it's got the same name and then you know they carried on anyway they started saying Sheikh said these are for my students and whatever da, da, da. and then they started just talking and talking and just, mashallah, it went all the way. The Sheikh was supposed to stay there for a little bit, all the way until we heard the Adhan. And subhanAllah, Sheikh Musa Abad said, يعني يعني you know, come back and have dinner with us. This is that, please, you know, we'll be honored to have you as our guest. Come back, please. And then the Sheikh was like, Allah, excuse me, you know, I, I don't want to be a burden upon you. But because Sheikh Muhammad Muhyiddin, he came for a purpose to visit the sick. He doesn't want to be, you know, a burden upon Sheikh Musa Abad. After we prayed Salat al-Isha, I remember we prayed Salat al-Isha, straight away after we left, Sheikh Abdul Razak obviously was there, Al-Badr, and Sheikh Abdul Rahman Muhyiddin, Sheikh Abdul Razak came and kissed Sheikh Abdul Rahman Muhyiddin on his head, and he gave him, he gave him salam, how are you Sheikh, and he was asking Sheikh Abdul Rahman Muhyiddin, how are you doing, how's everything, this, this, that, and you know, he asked him about him, how's his, you know, I came to visit your father, he goes, Zafullah khair Sheikh, and I, wallahi, had them in Hukuk al-Muslim, this, this, that, and it was just, he was holding his hand, you know, and then he gave salam to Sheikh Muslim Abad as well. And he gave salam to him. He said, "I'll see you, inshallah." Sheikh Muslim again invited him to him, come, come, come in, come in with, with us. And I said, "No, Zakhla Khair." Sheikh Abdul Razak invited him. He said, "Zakhla Khair." You know, I've done that which I need to do. And then, Subhanallah, in a nice way, Subhanallah, it was beautiful moments. And then Sheikh Abdul Razak went to his house. Sheikh Muslim entered his house, and then we entered the car. And the Sheikh he drove me all the way. But he didn't just leave me there. Subhanallah, he could have gone home. He's got family members. He's got life. And he drove me back to the Masjid, uh, Masjid Quba. And then. You know, we did more, you know, we benefited more asking him questions. You know, subhanAllah, I benefited asking him more questions and what have you, how he was, who, bene- who had an influence on him, how he was in life and this, this, that. He's given me reminders and benefiting, benefiting me. And, you know, it's just nothing but beautiful moments. And then eventually, alhamdulillah, you know, he dropped us off. And then um, that moment was a moment, you know, to that I would never forget. And the Sheikh eventually, alhamdulillah, like I said, the year after that came, it was a Dawra, Ilmiya, he went to Jeddah. I, I, Qadr Allah, I wasn't able to go. I told the Shaykh, I said, Qadr Allah, I'm not able to go. And even for Hajj as well, Alhamdulillah, my Quran teacher told me so many good things about him. So I've done Hajj with him many times. I know him, you know, he's very hardworking. He loves knowledge and the people. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen managed to benefit from the Shaykh. And, you know, all the moments that we had, the private moments, the open moments, moments where he would always tell us, remind us of Allah, he remind us of the Akhirah. He would tell us, I remember even in terms of giving us books, he gave us so many books. Um, he would tell us to memorize. He would, at one time as well, you know, when, if, it were, if we're not prompted, tell us, look, I'm doing this so I can make you guys be more, you know, serious when it comes to seeking knowledge and be more diligent, seek knowledge more, benefit. I know every time I remember, subhanAllah, he would always say to me and the brothers, you know, um, like the brothers that were in Libya or the brothers that were, that, that were close to him, he, so he would tell us that, you know, seek knowledge, teach the people to heed. Remind them, this is that. And I remember he told us a story of when he first ever did the khutbah. He was fought, he was basically pushed into, into doing it. He said that when he did it that day, he said, I'll never forget. He said, my leg was shaking to the extent that the hadith, I, 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 I did it like, you know, I, I quoted it the wrong way around. And then I was obviously, I corrected. He said, but that's how everyone starts. He said, slowly, slowly you start. Eventually Allah gives you tawfiq, but always be sincere. And ask Allah Azza to give it to Afiq and make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal and spread this deen. People need and are in the dire need. He said, Sometimes, Abdullah, I go to these villages in Saudi Arabia. People don't know anything about anything. You'll be shocked. And I teach them. And he said, And they say to me, When I go there, Alhamdulillah, you know, a moon has come. You know, like meaning like someone has come of knowledge to spread the knowledge and light upon us. So the Shaykh, he, he was known that he would be from those that used to love, you know, remembering Allah. He used to love always giving us reminders. 
many times he would see people in the haram advise them. He said, how, how the masakeen, how these people, you know, they're masakeen, they don't know, remind them. And I remember I asked the Sheikh a question about, you know, the problems that we have in the UK and this is that. And the Sheikh would advise us, said, look, the people need you to teach them knowledge, teach them. He goes, always see that you're less than the people. The general coming for people, don't see yourself that you're above them, see that you're below them. So it pushes you, said that I always see myself that I'm below people, you know, I'm less than people. That it pushes me to do more. It makes me strive even more. He said, be like that, Abdullah. You know, always be from those that are diligent, teaching the people. He said, that's what's going to remain. Teach the people, teach them, you know, teach them about the ulama, teach them about Islam, Tawheed, teach them about everything, you know, make them love this knowledge and be kind to them. So this was, you know, the Shaykh, Shaykh Rahman Muhyiddin. Every single time I taught people mention him, they just have nothing but love for the Shaykh. So may Allah Azza wa Jal accept it, you know, from the Sheikh, have mercy on him. So brothers and sisters, don't forget him in your dua. You know, he has touched a lot of the people and he was close with a lot of the ulama and anything that I have missed out, then, you know, it's a deficiency for me because obviously, like I said, this is not something that I'm going to, it's going to be the best biography of him, but just something that I thought I would touch on that which Allah has made easy for me and that which I had been given by the brother and that which I remember, may Allah Azza would accept it. But this was the Sheikh and brothers, try your best. Those that are there now, have the opportunity to visit Umrah, tour, whatever, tourist visa, studying, visit the ulama, sit under them and benefit from them. Subhanakallahumma alhamdulillah, shalom wa ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa akhid da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.